Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified, episode 55. Where does the time go? Well, last week I was thinking about boiling down trading to a few different things and trends and pullbacks and money management and a lot of things that I like to do and believe in. And then, of course, some trading psychology. And then I got to thinking, what if I took it one step further and boiled down trading to a word? And that word is acceptance. So this is part two of, I'm not sure how far I'm going to take it, but as I said last week, I think each one of these could be a show in in of itself. And I do believe that if you're willing to accept the things I'm going to show you, you're going to be well on your way to becoming a successful trader. Or, as I often say, if you have lost your way, as we all occasionally do, it'll put you back on track. We have a new mystery chart this week. Housekeeping. By the way, I do take requests. If there's something you want me to cover, let me know. And lately what I've been doing is covering it in my Thursday show, which is Dave Landry's Week in Charts. And if you check my website on Thursdays, there should be a link to sign up there. Sign up once and you're good for the next 20 or 30 shows. Anyway, the show's a little bit more free format than this particular one, both in time and format. So I'm able to cover more in that show. And I'll be happy to answer your questions there. If you need to reach me, davelander.com slash contact. If you want the slides from this presentation and all the other presentations, which include the setups and a lot of psychology and the money management and everything else, go to davelander.com slash stock charts. I'll also give you limited access to the members area, which includes an introductory course, a market timing course, and a few other things, and all three of my books. And that should keep you busy for a while. So get to know me first. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and methodology in action. I'm going to use one of the prior mystery charts as an example this week. This is this week's mystery chart. As you can see, nice uptrend in place. It formed a TKO, and then it continued to pull back. This is an IPO, and this is a pattern I call a first deep retracement. It's when an IPO takes off just like this and then pulls back very deeply. We have an entry here. We have a stop down here. And initial profit target is up here. Remember, initial profit target is where we take off half of our shares. And at that point, our stop is moved to break even. In that way, barring overnight gaps, we have the potential to capture a longer term move. Longer term trend trading has abysmal drawdowns and very, very low accuracy, maybe 23% if that much accuracy. But if you can get a swing trade out first, then you can position yourself for longer-term trading. Go in and watch the shows we've done on money management and obviously see my website for a lot more on that. So trading in a word all boils down to acceptance. So let's talk about a few things that we talked about last week. Just a little quick recap. The only way to make money on a trade is to capture a trend. So if you buy at A and sell at B, then B has to be higher than A in order for you to make money. I know, duh, but many people fight the trend. And by the way, even if you are a contra-trend trader, a new trend in the direction of your trade better develop soon, or otherwise you won't make any money. You have to accept that no one knows what will happen next. Forget about all these YouTube gurus that tell you that they have the secret. If they had the secret, then they wouldn't have to be selling it to you. You're probably thinking, well, Dave, why aren't you selling stuff? Yeah, but I'm selling more reality when it comes to the market and not some get-rich-quick standing in front of a rented jet or whatever else they do. But before I digress too far, you have to accept the fact that markets trade on emotions, period. Like I said last week, quoting Mary McClellan, some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use more sophisticated methods. One way to wrap your head around that is to be cognizant of your own emotions. And speaking of emotions... Except the fact that there's a neurology at work. And this has been a bit of an epiphany for me, learning that there's neurology in trading in addition to psychology. And that, along with acceptance, has really helped me to wrap my head around all these unnatural feelings. Remember, trading is a very unnatural thing to do. And that's one of the things we'll touch upon today and I'm sure many other shows. But... One of the neurology things, in addition to every decision has an emotion attack, attached, even what you're going to have for lunch, is that a negative emotion has twice the impact as a positive one. 
and I'm going to flesh that out in a little more detail just to kind of drive that point home. And the, the point there is that trading almost has this, this negative expectancy, so to speak, when it comes to emotions. You also have to obviously accept that there's a psychology at work. And one good example there of many is that successful people don't get that way by doing nothing. And successful people, especially successful doctors, lawyers, or automatic transmission mechanics, plumbers, or anyone who has to put in a lot of time, a lot of education, an apprenticeship, or whatever, when it comes to trading, they try to transfer that success. And they find it can be very difficult because they didn't become successful by sitting around and not doing anything. But many times in trading, you're either waiting for a trade or you're waiting in a trade for something to happen. Now, as I said last week, just real quick, Greg Morris once said, markets only make new highs about 4% of the time. So I took a 20-year period, I'm sorry, a 10-year period of the spiders, and I plotted a negative 1 in red for anything that wasn't a brand new one year high and then everything else was in green. So this pretty much looks like it's in line with Greg's analysis or Greg's statement. And as you can see, not too often is this market making new highs, but this market actually went up. Not that I would recommend you buy and hold as a strategy in and of itself, but if you did buy and hold over this period of time, this 10 years, these 10 years, the market went up 211%. But you can see most of that time was spent backing and filling. Now, we talked about this one last week, so this is just updating it. This is a form of mystery chart. And we entered here, and on the first day, we're at a loss. So that's a negative observation. We had a couple of days of positive movement, and then it traded below the highest close. It got maybe a cent or two above it for one day, and then it went back below. We made a new closing high, and then as you can see, about a week or so's worth of trading below that closing high. So you're giving up those open profits. You spent a lot of time giving up those open profits. We went back to profitability, gave up profits for a couple days, back to profitability, giving up profits, rinse and repeat. So if you add up everything in this particular chart, you had 11 positive observations and one was only by one cent, but let's just count it as a positive. And then you had 10 negative observations, okay? And that's where, again, you're giving up open profits, but those count twice as much on an emotional scale as a positive one. Now, this isn't a fantastic example just yet, but if we continue to ride out this trend, it's gonna have weeks and maybe even months of backing and filling. And it's very hard to stick with a market when you have these negative observations. So even though overall this market went up and it was actually more positive than negative, if you're looking at the fact that your emotions are twice as strong for a negative observation as a positive one, you end up with a net negative from a mental perspective of minus nine. Now, if you actually look at the trade, you could see that we're up 46%, or at least we were when I took this snapshot. And that's a $3,193 gain on a 100K account. So you buy roughly 600 shares, a little bit more, on a 100K account if you're risking 2%. And I like to use 100K as a model. It just gives you a good kind of round number to work with. And obviously $3,000 gain is what? A 3% gain on the account. And you can see that little mystery chart is right there below it for the buy for today. Now, if you were to look at 10 minute charts on that same stock, you were up, you were down, you were up, you were down, you were up, you were down a whole lot, you were up a little bit, you were down, 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 back to being up, feeling pretty good, and then you're back to being mostly down, okay? You went up a little bit, and then down, then up, and then now giving up some of those, some of those open profits again. So the point is, the more observations you make, the more likely it's going to be a negative observation. And even if the market went up equally as much as it went down, once you're in a position, 
negative emotion scores twice the emotional response as a positive one, then you would end up with a downward spiral that would look something like this. So one positive observation, one negative observation is minus one. One, another positive observation, another negative observation is minus two. And you can see how if you're not careful, you can end up in a downward spiral. And this is especially true if you're watching every tick and glued to the screen. Now, here's a biggie, especially as a trend follower. And by the way, I'm framing everything within the lens of trend following, but this goes for a lot of other methods too. You have to accept the fact that all trades eventually end badly. This was an example of a former mystery chart we talked about where we were able to get a swing trade profit out of it, half at that IPT, the initial profit target above. But then you could see, as great as this position looked, it began to implode and we got stopped out on the remaining shares. So all trades, all trend trades at least, will have an unhappy ending if you are a trend follower, but you still made money overall. Now you have to accept the fact that the map is not the territory. This is a little IPO. And I was looking to buy on a five day closing high Provided that close was above the high of day one, because in this particular week, so far, the high was on day one. And then on day four, we took out that day one high, so I'm no longer worried about the day one high. And that'll make a lot more sense if you go back two weeks and watch Dave Landry's The Week in Charts. And I'll have a YouTube link come, here, up, come up, so you can go to my channel for that. Anyway, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to enter at 21, and right around the close, this is a one-minute chart, I'm looking at the stock, and it's at 2140, so I was like, well, this is going to close well above 21 to give me an entry, so I might as well just go ahead and get in now. And then 30 seconds, 40 seconds later, I'm feeling pretty darn good. I'm like, yay, this is fantastic. And then what happened, right before the close, the stock implodes and comes right back in. And technically, it did not trigger based in this pattern. The point I'm trying to make here is if you went in and looked at the charts, okay, studying my buy at B pattern and IPOs, you would see all these stocks that close in new highs and then took off, but you would miss the fact that if when you went to in implement it, you would have some that would be on the cusp and not actually close because you don't know, obviously, until after the close. So you have to use a little discretion. And then, boo, it came right back in by the close. And I went home, I think this was on a Friday, at a loss. Now, you need to accept the fact that there's going to be a lot of resistance. Stephen Pressfield wrote a book called The War of Art. It's a, it's a one-setting type of read. I would urge you to get it. It's pretty cheap, and the book is, spoiler alert, is based on resistance. And I see the life of a trader as kind of the life of an artist, and I'll have more to say on that in coming shows, but without digressing too far, in the first few pages of the book, he talks about activities that most commonly elicit resistance, and he listed 11 of these, and 11 really struck a chord with me. And 11 says, the taking of any principled stand in the face of adversity. So that means honoring your stop on a trade and not getting out early. In other words, not micromanaging. That would be one form of resistance that's going to tempt you to bust your plan. And then he went on to say, in other words, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity. So I'm going to show you one of my mistakes, which I've been beating myself up over, where in one account I saved $143 and felt pretty good. I actually made that, but I gave up thousands of dollars. And across multiple accounts, it was a five-figure so far and counting era. And I'm a little upset about that. That was resistance, or expressed another way, any act that derives from our higher nature instead of our lower. All of these will elicit 
resistance. And if you've been trading for more than a day, you know what I'm talking about. It reminds me of Marcellus Wallace and Pulp Fiction. And he was talking to Butch, the fighter, who was going to throw a fight for Marcellus Wallace. And he had a little speech with him. And he says, the night of the fight, you might feel a little slight sting. That's pride effing with you. F pride. Pride only hurts. It never helps. You fight through that stuff. Well, if we scratch out night and fight and put in day and trade, the day of the trade, you might feel a slight sting. That's pride effing with you. F pride. Pride only hurts. It never helps. You fight through that stuff. And believe me, as a trader, you'll spend a lot of time fighting through that stuff. Now, this was an example I used last week. I want to drive the point home. We had a stop of 44 in this particular stock. And you could see it was kind of going right up. This was a short. And then in Facebook, somebody said, hey, I went ahead and stopped out of that. Okay. And in last week in charts, I said, okay, did did you lower your stop to that level or uh, explain to me what happened? It's like, no, I just decided to get out. And to my surprise, several other people in the group who were also in the week of charts chimed in and said, yeah, I got out too. Well, what they were trying to do was avoid any pain from 41 and change all the way up to 44. They didn't want to lose any more money on the trade. Well, the next day the stock implodes. Now, it's since bounced back, so this might not turn into the best example ever. And by the way, busting that plan, giving into that resistance, okay, will work many times and will work quite often over the short term, but longer term, rarely does it pay off because you're going to miss that occasional big winner. And in future shows, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, I'll probably talk about you have to accept the fact that the methodology, trend following at least, is skewed. Time and time again, people say, Dave, I can't make any money following your stuff. It's like, well, show me your trades. Let's look at what I recommended. Let's let's sort it all out. And not all the time, but many times, it's like, well, you missed this one trade, and I see you were $10,000 in the hole, but this one trade, you'd have made $25,000 on it, so you would be well out of the hole. And as one example, somebody pointed out CRSR, an example I'm going to show in just a few minutes, they said, hey, I was in a drawdown because we've been talking a lot, a lot about drawdowns lately until that one trade. Sometimes it just takes one good trade to get you out of a drawdown. If you micromanage yourself out of that one good trade, you're never going to catch that good trade as Murphy would have it. That one trade that might be necessary for your year. Now, I am not holier than now. I have to resist all of these temptations and emotions all the time. In this particular trade, I was able to get partial profits out, make a little bit of money. But then I said, you know what? I got $1.43 left in this trade from where it is down to my stop. I'm just going to go ahead and bail out, and I'll put $143 per 100K allocations, meaning that there's only 100 shares left per 100K in separate accounts. And then, of course, this thing took off without me. Now, it's since gone up another 15 or so points from here. So this was a $1,000 mistake times, I'm not going to tell you how many times, but quite a bit. And at this point in time, the end counting, it's right around a five-figure plus mistake. And that's a lot of money. I don't care who you are. That's a lot of money that I left on the table because I couldn't resist busting my plan. Now, along those lines, you have to accept the fact that the market often rewards bad behavior. One thing that I talk about ad nauseum and beat the dead horse on is that the market is a really, really bad teacher. You have to learn to separate process from skill, and you have to follow that process, and you have to separate luck from skill. And if you get lucky on a bad trade and make money, you have not done the right thing. And as I often say, that'll work until it don't. Now, what do I mean by this? Let me just give you one of many examples, and that's one individual I'm picking on, but there's more than him. So I was in this particular trade. This was recommended in my trading service. We, we made a little money on it by hitting the initial profit target, and then it came right back in really hard and stopped out. Well, somewhere around 
early October, I get a phone call from him. What should I do at LAC? Well, LAC stopped out a long time ago, as you can see, again, based on a hypothetical 100K account, although I do actually take these trades. But for educational purposes and for teaching purposes, obviously, I use a hypothetical 100K account. Anyway, as you can see, 1000 bucks plus 333 is where we stopped out on a remainder. And this thing took off and went straight up. And had I held on along with my client, I would be up 100%. But that was not the thing to do. The thing to do was allow yourself to stop out. And this year has been one of those years where a lot of these go-go stocks have imploded, but they turn around and go straight and going straight back up 200, 300% or more. And he's in quite a few of these stocks and the behavior is really bad behavior, but he's made a whole lot of money with that bad behavior. I know it's a little kind of perverse when it comes to the markets. The market can be, again, a really bad teacher. Now, here's a big, you know, like I said earlier, I could do a presentation on any one of these, and I actually did a fairly long presentation just on that. You have to accept the fact that there are two U's. Mark Douglas once said, the more we understand about the interacting forces behind our own behavior and the interacting environmental forces outside of us, the easier it is for us to fulfill our needs and achieve our goals. Amen, my brother. From another mother. Unfortunately, Mark's no longer with us. I was supposed to be on a project with Mark once. Talked to him once or twice. Super nice guy. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. I'm a big fan of epiphanies. And this is my favorite definition, especially as it relates to trading. A sudden intuitive perception of or insight into the reality or essential meaning of something. Usually initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or experience. Well, the thing about trading is the more you learn about it, the more it unfolds. It's kind of like a, a flower unfolding. And, and I began to learn a little bit about neurology combined with this psychology. And I learned from Brett Steenbarger that people lose money in the markets because the person who places the trade is very often not the same person who manages and closes the trade. Quite literally, another self has taken over, another mind. Well, he was referring more to the primal part of your brain and the more developed part of your brain, left brain, right brain. Well, there's also more of a neurology involved, too. And part of my epiphany recently is that there's actually some chemicals sloshing around up there. We'll take a look at that in just one second. So they really are two U's. Now, years ago, I knew a couple who were traders and the husband would find the trade and put the trade on and then the wife would manage the trade and i was thinking well she's got an easy job she doesn't have to do the research she doesn't have to find the trade and then do the execution and all this other stuff well it didn't take me long to realize that she's got a much harder job than he does her job is 10 times harder than hers. The you that manages the trade or the you that manages trade is a much more difficult job than the you that puts the trade on. There's excitement going in and then there's reality once you're in the trade. Now, as I said, it's like a flower unfolding the more you learn all these different things. And, and my epiphany is that there's a neurology involved. And now if you look at you before the trade and you during the trade, I didn't realize until recently that there's actually a chemistry involved with that neurology. And this research comes from The Molecule of More. It's a book I just started reading. And I think it's a great book to learn about dopamine and other chemicals and how it affects your brain. And before the trade, you are jacked up on dopamine because dopamine is the excitement of the future, not necessarily the realization of whatever that thing may be. Have you ever wanted a certain thing and you were all excited about getting it, all excited about getting it, and it's like, oh, okay, I got it, and, and then that's it. There's the here and now, or H&N, 
which deals with what's going on in the present. So dopamine is seen as an anticipation of pleasure. And then the here and now are other chemicals such as serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins, and endocannabinoids. Now, notice it sounds a lot like cannabis, and it's sort of related, and that's what makes you feel good in your brain. Those are the here and now chemicals versus the dopamine, which is before the trade. Now, before the trade, there's optimism. During the trade, there's hope. Before the trade, there's excitement. And there's possibly boredom during the trade, waiting for that market to move. There's enthusiasm. And then there's fear. There's promise. And then, of course, reality. Reality is the H and N, the here and now. There's known because everything is known. We got a nice trend. We got a TKO. It's a good looking chart. And then once you step into that trade, you're stepping into the unknown. A lot of logic applies going into the trade. Dave says strong trend, accelerating trend, serious knockout bar, all of that logic. And then there's emotions, a lot of emotions that happen when you're, especially if you're mentally monetizing as we normally do. In a case like this, notice that the trade's underwater after being above water for maybe one or two days. So there's a lot of negative emotions involved with this trade. It's more statistical going in and irrational during the actual trade. The emotions have taken over. Little certainty going in. Step one, step two, step three. Let's say you're trading a Landry Light pullback. Okay, Dave says 10 days above the exponential moving average, 30 exponential moving average, pullback to the moving average. Okay, I got it. I know he's a discretionary trader. But I can put some statistics and certainty to it. This looks like what he's he likes to trade. And then obviously there's uncertainty because nobody can predict the future. Your environment is static going in and then it's fluid once you're in a trade. I think it was Montier said when talking about behavioral science and behavioral finance that stress goes up when information is changing or unknown. So when is information changing or unknown? Well, as soon as the market opens, that begins to happen. So that's when that stress begins to kick it into gear. So unless you find someone to manage your trades after you put them on, like the aforementioned couple, you're really going to have to embrace and understand the fact that there are to use. Well, I'm out of time. I want to thank you guys and girls for watching today. If you need to reach me, daylander.com slash contact. If you want these slides and a lot more stuff, go to daylander.com slash stock charts and put your information there. Thanks for watching and may the trend be with you. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.